What's going on, everyone? Taylor Kyles and Mike Cadillac here with CLNS Media coming at you with another episode of Pats Daily brought to you by our good friends at Prize Picks and Game Time. Today, we're starting a series where we are going to break down the Patriots' different position groups throughout this offseason where we don't have a whole lot to talk about. So, might as well try to get in depth with the team that we cover. Today, we're going to be tackling defensive line where the Patriots probably have the most depth on their team Mike before we get into some of your different categories talking about sleepers surprise trade candidates all that good stuff what's your general overview of this position for New England yeah so I'll uh, I'll preface this whole thing as a um, as an exercise I started last offseason where exactly like you said it's it's kind of the dog days of summer right you have like a month a month and a half from in between uh, the OTAs and the training camp where you're kind of looking for content. You're stretching for something, but it's a good it's a good uh, time to really take an audit of the entire roster. So last summer, uh, I started it when I was at, with WEI, uh, position by position breakdowns of everything we've seen. So or you know what to look for heading into the season, starting with an overview, who we're sleeping on, trade candidates, surprise cuts, um, and then a roster projection in a series that will be up on now on CLNSmedia.com called Patriots Depth Projection. So you can check that out. The defensive line is already up there. Uh, the overview on the defensive line, Taylor, is uh, a room where you mentioned the depth, but it also looks to me like a room that um, is trying to get younger, uh, just like sort of the old, the whole Patriots, excuse me, the whole Patriots team is doing. The first, one of their first moves coming in as a new regime in the offseason was obviously cutting uh, or releasing rather Lawrence Guy, um, stalwart veteran who was on the defensive line for a number of seasons here, won a Super Bowl, um, was just a consummate pro, and they basically cut him loose and said, hey. We're sort of rebuilding. You probably want to go out there and either get paid or maybe try and win another Super Bowl. We're not in this position now, so see you later. So that tells me right off the bat that they are trying to get younger. Um, now you're looking at the elder statesman in the room being Daniel Falala, who's 30. Uh, Dietrich Wise, Devon Godshaw, 29, and the rest are under 27. And obviously Christian Barmore, who is the star of the show. Um, and then the other guys, Tristan Hills, Jeremiah Farms, Sam Roberts, Armin Watts, Keon White, all 27 or younger, like I mentioned. So a young rebuilding room with a lot of depth too. Obviously Barmore is, is the big guns just signed the, you know, four year, $92 million extension, but Keon white is a second, you know, a second year guy who has a lot of potential. Armin Watts is a free agent signing this off season. Jeremiah farms, someone who we'll talk about later really came on strong uh, at the end of last season after, you know, he's a two year veteran out of friends university, never really played in an NFL game, couple call-ups last year, played pretty well. And then signs to the active roster, all of a sudden he can make an impact. So uh, it's a room that it's, you know, again, one of the, I think, better rooms on obviously the better side of the ball on the defense um, with a lot of potential and room to grow. So uh, looking forward to sort of seeing what, you know, what you think of my thoughts on the room um, and also where they can go and how they can grow heading into 2024. Yes, sir. So first, let's give some credit to guys who don't get a ton of attention. Let's start with your sleepers from this defensive line group. So like I said or just a second ago, uh, I think Jeremiah Farms is a, a massive sleeper on this team. And I think you kind of honestly, we had a conversation last week on the show that kind of changed my view on Farms because he was a guy who I didn't necessarily think of him as someone who was going to, um, you know, frankly, be on the team and contribute this year, even though he had success last year. But now looking at the situations, which we'll get to with Devon Gotcha's contract um, and sort of where the room is looking to go. Mixed with the rave reviews that uh, Demarcus Covington gave last year of Farms, and saying the reason he got on this team is because of what he's done in practice, and he, you know, he looks um, looks like a solid player. Farms came in last year. He played 68 snaps, six total tackles, a fumble recovery. Doesn't sound like a ton, but you know, under the radar, defensive tackle isn't necessarily a stat position. It's what you see on the field, um, and he played pretty well. So I think mixed into the fact that they may move on from Godshaw, they may not. Um, you know, re-sign him or extend him or do what have you with him. Farms is a guy who can actually make an impact depending on where the rest of it goes. And so I think I was sleeping on him. You mentioned him as somebody who played pretty well last season. I kind of dug into it more, looked at some clips and things like that. And he's someone who I think is going to end up making this roster um, given where they are with Godshaw and the rest of the room. Yeah, I agree. The thing with Godshaw, and again, we will get into him more later, but he's really just a run defender. He is a starter on this team, but he's a very one-dimensional piece. Jeremiah right. Farms flashed as both a run defender and a pass rusher. He's only 300 pounds, so he's definitely on the lighter side for a nose tackle, mm -hmm. but he's stout. He holds his ground pretty well. He can stack and shed, and as a pass rusher, he's got explosiveness, and he's really active with his hands, which really impressed me. There was a play against the Broncos where he had like a crazy spin move where he beat three blockers. 
which you wouldn't expect from a guy like right. Jeremiah Arms, who the common fan probably doesn't know that he exists. Not to be disrespectful, again, he was on the practice squad, so just right. a very under radar guy. And you mentioned the fumble recovery. It was a more impressive play than you would just think looking at a stat sheet. He actually got buried on the play. I think he took on a double team and was on the ground, right. then showed his motor where he gets up, runs to the play, and then Dietrich Twice strips it, he ends up jumping on it. So I 100% agree. I think Jeremiah Farms is someone who's going to have a bigger role this season. We also saw in uh, mini camp and OTAs with Devon Gotcha out, Jeremiah Farms was a pretty significant piece of that defense when it looked like they were really working through their base packages. And he can contribute on passing downs. You never see Devon Gotcha on the field when you know pass is coming, but they did experiment with Jeremiah Farms in that way, so I completely agree. He's about 29, 30 years old. That's one you know red flag I have, yeah. but he doesn't have a lot of tread on his tires, so I'm really excited to see what he can do this. I time. think it's, yeah, I think it says a lot that, again, with the new, uh, since COVID, these practice squad ele- elevation rules have kind of changed. I think it says a lot that he's a guy who they burnt all three, all three uh, elevations on, and then essentially like, yeah, we need to sign you. A lot of times it's kind of reverts back to the practice squad. We'll just use another practice squad guy and not have to burn a, you know, a roster elevation. But when Calvin Anderson went to IR, they end up signing farms to a two year deal. Um, clearly showing that they have some faith in him. Again, I, I think what, uh, what Demarcus Covington, who was the defensive line coach last year, now turns into the defensive coordinator. I think clearly he has some confidence in farm. So I'm um, again, a guy who I see making the roster and uh, could make an impact depending on what happens with the rest of the room. Yeah, because he was, I'm pretty sure he got elevated because Devon Gotcha got banged up at some point, like yeah. midway through the season. And yep. we were like, is he going to play? Is he not? And Farms got on the field and he wasn't just a placeholder. Like you said, he actually established himself and earned a role. Marcus Covington, once again, gave him a lot of praise. So, you know, don't want to beat a dead horse, but right. he really is an exciting player who I think more Patriots fans should have on their radar. Great call there. Let's move on to the not-so-optimistic uh, yeah. end of the spectrum. Surprise cuts. They feel like they happen every season at some position. Who do you think it's going to be along the defensive line? Yeah, last year when I did this, it was Lawrence Guy. I was about a season too early. I thought they might have just you know nipped it in the bud last year and said you can move on, but they kept it around. Uh, I'm curious what you think on this one too, but I'm going with Daniel Okwale because of sort of the same reasons with the rest of the guys in that room at that position where, first off, like I mentioned, they're trying to get younger. They're rebuilding. This is a... 2025 team this isn't a 2024 team Aquale's 30 uh played only three games last season is coming off a torn biceps the year before he missed two games due to a suspension ended up coming in and playing well don't get me wrong but I just wonder if they do find a common ground with Godcha and they do think Jeremiah Farms is an up-and-coming guy who can sort of like you said a little bit older but less tread on his tires if they can fill the room that way and Aquale sort of ends up just being a guy that they can you know cut and move on and Maybe keep another receiver, keep another special team. Or like it, it comes down to those, you know, decisions where you have to decide between your third or fourth defensive lineman and your third or fourth receiver, depending on the strength of the defense, et cetera, you wonder. Um, so I just think coming off an injury, oldest player in the room, trying to get younger, all of those things kind of combined. It, I wouldn't be shocked if they end up cutting bait with a quality and just letting him walk uh, at the end of training camp. No, I agree. I don't think he's going to get cut, but anytime Mm -hmm. I do roster projections, especially in the past couple seasons, he's been the guy where I'm like, "Uh, they could cut him if they needed to, maybe sneak him onto the practice squad. At his age, considering he's put some good tape, um, or he's put up some good tape, I don't know if he'd actually want to be on the practice squad unless it was a situation where they're like, hey, just for a week or two, we're going to elevate you, make sure you get playing time. I do think he's a valuable member of that room. He is depth at, again, a pretty deep position. Like, if you look at the interior, he's a defensive tackle and nose tackle. I do like that versatility because you don't have that quite as much with some of the other depth pieces. Like, Jeremiah Farms is more of a true nose tackle. Devon Godshaw is more of a true nose tackle, although he's played some, you know, defensive end, defensive tackle type in some of their uh, odd fronts. But, yeah, he makes the most sense because, like you said, Armand Watts is a younger guy. Jeremiah Farms, not really younger, but a guy who seems like he's on the rise. And if they do end up keeping Devon Gotcha and it just turns into a numbers game where it's like, hey, we got to get rid of somebody, right. he's the only one where when you weigh, one, the fact that he is a depth player and the fact that he's older, it would kind of make sense if they did move on from him. Again, I don't think they will. I hope they don't because I think he's a really fun player. Well, that's why it's a surprise. That's why it's not an easy cut. It's someone who, hey, maybe it just happens, right? But yeah. He, he, He does fit the bill very well for that. We got some more stuff to cover. But first, quick word from our friends at Price Picks. Be right back. You can win up to 100 times your money on Price Picks with as little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000. 
With the NBA Finals over, the hoops action doesn't stop on prize picks. Women's basketball is just heating up, with stars like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese looking to make names for themselves, alongside greats like Brianna Stewart and Asia Wilson. You can earn up to 100 times your cash watching them ball out. Prize picks is available in more than 30 states across the country, including California, Texas, and Georgia. I made my first $10 deposit and received an instant $10 bonus. If you have the skills, you can play for a shot at turning your $10 into $1,000. I've got Caitlin Clark for more than three and a half three points made and Brianna Stewart for more than 23 points. For baseball, I've got Kyle Schwarber for more than nine hitter fantasy score and Bryce Miller for more than four pitcher strikeouts. Download the app today and use the code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. That's code CLNS for a first deposit match up to $100. Prize picks. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, now we're going to continue with some guys who may not be on the Patriots roster, looking at some potential trade candidates. Now, I feel like, you know, with recent news, this one is kind of like a flashing sign a little yeah. bit, but let the people know who you think it's going to be and why. It is number 92, Devon Godshaw Taylor. It's a guy who we just did a whole video on it, which is also on the channel. You can go check that out right now. So we'll kind of rehash some things there. But uh, I really do at this point think they could maybe dangle Devon Godshaw as a trade chip if they don't see themselves finding common ground on a contract. Godshaw um, last night tweeted that him and the Patriots are, again, trying to find that middle ground and he wants to stay here. He wants to retire here. But it has to make, safe, make sense for him and his team. Uh, Godshaw signed a two-year deal in 2021. Then he signed a, a two-year extension uh, after the first season with a little bit of a pay bump, and now he's in the second season of that uh, and is looking for some more guaranteed money because right now that guaranteed money is up. Um, I think, again, you, you look at – every time I do this and I look at every room, for the trade candidates, you have to look at the guys who are in the final year of their contracts because if you don't find something contract-wise, they end up uh, you know walking and being a free agent, and if you lose them, you get nothing for them. So – at least in this situation, you have Godshaw under contract for a year. A team that's looking for a, a veteran run stuffer um, could easily just kind of say, hey, we'll give you, call it even a seventh round pick, right? Now, I'm not saying that that's what he's worth, but I'm saying if you're not going to pay him, he's going to stay on the team. He's going to hold out to his, to his whole thing. And then he just walks after the season. You get nothing for him. It kind of seems like you know, it doesn't really make sense on that front, especially when you're a team that's trying to rebuild. So um they extended him two summers ago if they don't again find that common ground i think it could be reasonable like they're not just gonna cut him you might as well try and get something for him so i think they could dangle him and maybe get something back for him yeah i agree especially because next season he's not like a dj reader type really where he's a true yeah. space eater like he's kind of on the relatively smaller side for those big nose tackles so even if he left i'm not sure he'd sign a contract that was big enough to really factor into the compensatory pick formula unless it was right. kind of like a really late seven type before the godshaw news and this whole development i probably would have said matthew judon um, True. begrudgingly so, because I really do think he does like gotcha want to retire in New England. But I also think that Judon gives you every down flexibility that Godshaw does not. And that's really True. where the line's kind of drawn for me. Like I said, I like the depth they have with Equale, with Farms, but on the edge, it's much more of an unknown because you're Keon White obviously has gotten praise from Gerard Mayo, stepped up as a leader. When we're there at practice, right. he clearly is going to have a big role, but you don't know what you're getting quite yet. Then Anthony Jennings, elite run stopper, doesn't give you much in terms of pass rush. And Joshua Uche, very talented pass rusher, but we still have to see how he fits into this new scheme. There's way more questions there and less every down capability. Right. Whereas in the interior, I think there's more room for you to be kind of situational, especially considering they often use those three down fronts in pass rush. So you don't need quite as much depth on the right. inside as you do outside. So yeah, I, I I hate that I can't give you any pushback on any of these, but you're killing it. That's so, it's just, he does make the most sense, Scott. Yeah, I I will add with with Uche and Judon, um, and this is where the lines get blurred on like positionals, things like that, like ed edge rushers, edge of like I just have them as linebackers because that's technically what they're listed on the roster. So we can talk about them more in our in our linebacker depth projection and whether Judon will be a reasonable candidate. I agree that him. Look, when you look at that uh, again, when you look back at our video on Godshaw, we pull out the five highest paid Patriots, right and. Judon is number one, Godshaw's number three. Both of them don't have any guaranteed money. So, like, it makes sense to trade those guys. So, I think Judon is just as much a, um, 
a potential trade chip as as Gotra. We can just get that into that a little bit when the linebackers. I understand that some you look at edge, you look at the line and things like that. That's just a sort of a gray area here, but uh, I do think that he could potentially be a trade candidate too. Yeah. All right. So we went through uh, sleepers, we went through surprises, we went through trade candidates. Now, what is your roster projection? Who do you think is actually going to end up on the 53? Obviously, way too early, put that asterisk yep. all the time, but just based on what we know heading into training camp. So, like I said before, um, wait for verdicts on uh, – not that Uche and Jude won't, won't make the team, but you won't hear their names because I have them in the linebacker category, same with guys like Anthony Jennings. But uh, in, I have six players on the defensive line, and that is Christian Barmore, Devon Godshaw, Jeremiah Farms Jr., Armin Watts, Keon White, and Dietrich Wise. Out, Bradley William Bradley King, Daniel Aquale, surprise cut, is actual cut in here, uh, Tristan Hill, John Morgan the third. Sam Roberts, and Jotham Russell. So um, one thing I'll add is I do think they're going to end up getting something done with Godshaw. I don't think they're going to end up trading him. I do think they'll find that common ground. I feel like it's probably just going to end up being guarantee the money, keep him around for one season, uh, and then you let him walk at the end of next year. Barmore obviously makes the team. Jeremiah Farms, uh, I think we're sleeping on him. I think he's going to end up making the roster. Uh, over a guy like Daniel Aquale, and then Armin Watts just signed Keon White, second year player. Dietrich Wise becomes the oldest player in the room. Him and Devon Godshaw together, those are, you know, end up being the leaders moving us into the next sort of uh, generation after you cut Daniel Aquale. So uh, that's my uh, that's my projection. I think, again, Barmore, Godshaw, Farms, Watts, White, and Wise uh, are my six defensive linemen who make the team. Yeah, mine was pretty much identical, except I had Daniel Aquale on. I just okay. really like to have depth on the interior. And we saw it was already tested last season where Daniel Aquale went down against the Jets, then Godshaw gets hurt. And then, again, you have to start elevating somebody from the practice squad until he earns a role. So I really do want to keep him around. Yeah. And then in terms of the defensive line, I kind of consider Dietrich Wise and um, Keon White as defensive ends because right. sometimes they put their hand in the dirt, sometimes they stand up, they yeah. kick inside. I just, you know, they're not like Judon and Uche where – It's weird. It's a – it's a yeah, right. It's all – they're all yeah, kind of in, in the same thing. I, Like in my roster breakdowns, just certain stuff where it's like right. – end up this amount you're this if you, you know all that kind of stuff Fair. so yeah i pretty much agree um it was just hard for me to cut any of these guys i think that mm -hmm. depth is very valuable i think those are talented guys keep right. the rotation fresh like all the best defensive lines we see you know obviously that a lot of them have their bar more of their chris jones type where it's a guy that you really don't want to take off the field then you surround him with like a hockey team where you can just keep sending out waves of guys so by the fourth quarter that's what makes offensive line so hard is you can end up playing someone who's only been on the field for 10 snaps Right. But they're still fresh. Um, so I really do like the depth there. We're going to – Oh, I'm Prediction? Sorry. No, prediction. I want your prediction right now. What happens with Godshaw? Do they trade him? Do they cut him? Do they sign him? What happens? I think they keep him. I think it's okay. not that hard to guarantee his money for one year. Like yeah. I don't see them – you know, trying to get Brandon Ayuk or make it some crazy trade where they need that much money. Your draft right. picks are already signed. Obviously, you also need to put money aside for in-season signings, but those usually barely move the needle. I think right. they find something uh, with Godshaw, at least for this year, because um, I'm just not sure if they're prepared to lose someone of his magnitude. Again, I do like the depth of Kale and Jeremiah Farms, but I also think that Godshaw just gives you beef. At a position where, you know, you'd like some pass rush upside, but also he eats space better than those other guys. Um, so, yeah, I think he sticks around for at least a year. Now, we're going to get into grades, but first, quick words for my friends at Game Time. Nothing says summer quite like a live baseball game. And whenever I want to check out a Red Sox game at Fenway, I'm using Game Time, the best place for last minute deals on tickets. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. With Game Time, it's as easy as finding the game you want to attend, getting a view of the entire stadium to see what prices look like in different areas, and they actually do you a favor and show you both the cheapest tickets available and the best deals. You can also get the view from the seat that you pick, and between their lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, and job loss protection, there's really no better option than Game Time. And with Game Time's lowest price guarantee, the app will actually credit you 110% of the difference if you find a cheaper ticket elsewhere. Take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app 
create an account and use the code CLNS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code CLNS for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, buddy. Grade the Patriots defensive line. What do we think? Again, this is one of the deeper positions on the entire roster when you talk about not only the top end talent, but also the amount of guys that they can put in and actually get some quality production out of. So what are you thinking? I give them a B. Uh, and I think Bs are good, right? It's it, it sound, You hear B and it's like, oh, why don't you give them an A? They're supposed to be blah, blah, blah. like, no, B is good. They're not a great room. Um, heavily held down by Barmore. He's obviously a star. Dietrich Wise is very consistent. But you still have, you know, after that, Godshaw, just a, just a run stuffer, not really a pass rusher. Um, Keon White, solid last year, but we're sort of expecting him to grow and be that leader and, you know, have more of a dominant presence. Um, and then Jeremiah Farms, a guy we're relying on who, again, had like three good games last year. And I'm, I think we're sleeping on him. I think he's going to be pretty good. But there's a lot of if not definitiveness uh, in the room outside of guys like Barmore in Dutra Twice. So I think it's a B. They are good. Um, what, like I said, they're deep, depending on Equale, what, what you think of him and where he's going to be. But I do think that if Keon White can take that next step, if Jeremiah Farms can be a, a consistent presence, then you're talking, you know, you're talking towards the end of the season, this is a B plus, A minus type of room that really holds down the front of the defense. Um so yeah, I give him a B. I think there's room to grow. I don't necessarily think there's anything bad about the room. There's just things that there's two what ifs and two consistent players that kind of brings me to a B. I hate that I don't think I've disagreed with you once, but I'm <laughs> going on. He's going to say B plus, but honestly, okay. I do think he is fair because yes, Barmore holds it down. But I feel like this group is made up of a lot of guys where you can be optimistic. I think there's more reason for optimism than pessimism. But Definitely. they're all unknowns. Where Matt Judon, is he going to come back healthy? Right. Can Joshua Uche be that elite situational pass rusher that he was in 2022? Can Keon White take that step and really be a true leader in that room and take right. over for you? And Freddie Jennings, I think you know what you're getting out of him. Devon Godshaw, you know what you're getting out of those guys. Both high-end run stoppers. But then there's not a lot of guys who give you every down versatility. I think Jeremiah Farms you could kind of put in that mix. But even mm -hmm. still... How much can he produce if you actually have him on the field for significant snaps every single week? Daniel Lacroix, really good role player again. Dietrich Wise, I really like him. One as a person, he's hilarious. He's right. and he seems like a great leader. He's a captain, clearly a valuable guy there. Gives you versatility, and he's far from a bad player. But I think he's more solid than he is like the good player that he used to be in terms of run defense. That's never really been a strength of his. Um, so, you know, he's, I think, solid there. But as a pass rusher, I feel like he hasn't been quite as consistent as he was in years past. Part of that could just be due to the fact that he had such a heavy workload in 2022. Felt like they kind of took a step back on that in 2023. Maybe that had something to do with it. But yeah, I think this is a group where they're definitely on the up. There's a lot of young or maybe uh, relatively inexperienced talent and a lot of guys who have promise. And you're just like, let me see how they perform on the field under this defense and these circumstances definitely. and then we'll really have a definitive statement but i think b is totally fair because there is a lot of talent but i need to see them prove it before i start getting in that b plus a minus range i think that's a good point it's and it's the same system but it might be a little different they, they've talked about being a little bit more aggressive that's sort of been hinted at um demarcus covington goes from their position you know their position group leader to now their coordinator so they might change things up a little bit so i think you're right too that's a good way to look at it is a b there's, a, again, the what-ifs that are in the room as players. There's also a what-if with the defensive coordinator and how they sort of change the scheme and how they want to do things moving forward. Yep, absolutely. All right, this was fun. Uh, Mike, what are we doing for the next position group? Give people a little tease. Yeah, we are going to hit the offensive line next. So we're going to go uh, – that'll be up on Thursday morning, clnsmedia.com, another depth projection with the offensive line. Uh, and then we'll be back here on Press Pass to, uh, to go over it and uh, give all our grades and things like that for the offensive line. Going from the top position group to arguably the one yeah. sitting at the bottom. That's going to be a very fun discussion. To be fair, I do think there that's another room where maybe there's more uh, room for optimism. Yeah. I'm not saying they're going to be great or anything, but there are some options where this could be a solid unit, but we'll save that for the next time. In the meantime, y'all, make sure to take care of yourselves, take care of each other. We will see you next time. Peace.